Okay, everyone, good morning. Thanks for coming to our annual symposium. And um, but since we changed the name of the center to RCCS, it's the first symposium, although we've been running this symposium for the past uh, seven, eight years. Um, so there is definitely a continuum. But let me start off, um, give a little talk here. So um, this is to kind of highlight what we're doing as a center because this is an RCSS symposium and not just not a post-K symposium. Having said that, you know, post-K, uh, you know, you'll hear lots of infamy. You get lots of talks during the next couple of days. And we truly feel that the post-K is a game changer, um, uh, much more revolutionary than in K computer, which was sort of okay, but in some respects a little bit mediocre, like this processor. But we, the, the post-K processor we feel is revolutionary. The performance, his processor has super performance, it's very green and uh, very, um, a very high performance despite the fact that it uh, adheres to the ARM ecosystem and thus we'll see lots of applications and also adoption well beyond the post-K. But I'll talk about it a little bit later uh, and also you talk and other people will give the talk. We think of it all with the chronology of how we came to be. Um, so uh, K started around 2005, 2006 timeframe, at which time also the uh, computing centers in Japan started adopting um, the well, broad ecosystem. Uh, for example, my Tsubame one at yeah, Tokyo Tech. It was the first uh, number one uh, system in Japan on the top 500. But at the same time, it, was, it adopted many core, uh, the multi-core, as well as adopted the standard ecosystem, whereas the previous Japanese number one systems are all kind of special hardware. And um, you know, it didn't adhere to any of the standards. Um, in September, the case started. In uh, 2009, Fujitsu unveils the Spark. And of course, there were lots of uh, fiasco that a lot of people in Japan remember about near cancellation, which led to uh, you know, lots of complications. Good, uh, good news is that uh, the thing, uh, an organization called HPCI, which is very much like Brace or the um, uh, Exceed in the US, was born uh, as, as an outcome. And um, in 2010, Tsuami uh, 2 became the first petascale computer. And then April 20, 2001, Recan AICS, the predecessor to RCCS, was inaugurated. And uh, in June, uh, as planned, uh, 2011, K computer becomes top number one in the top 500. Actually, that was the objective for that machine. And uh, Gordon Bell prizes were won by the two top machines in Japan in 11. So everything was good. Um, at the same time, we have to recognize that 11, when we launched the you know machines like Tsubame and, of course, the K computer, already in April, people like Yutaka, uh, Ms. Sasato, myself, we already started the genesis of what became the post-K. So in 2011, we spent the whole year with a bunch of other people writing white papers, which led to the 2012-13 post-K feasibility study involving three architecture teams and one um, application team actually led, well, co-led the application um, requirements team. And in April 2014, the post-K project officially started. And this time, the objective was not to reach exaflops, that's per se, but to say that we will reach uh, 100 times speed up a uh, maximum, um, more than 100 times speed up on some of the benchmark applications. And of course, at the same time, um, uh, there were new accolades, and this kind of say, shows a change of times that the no longer top 500, sorry, Jack, was becoming less, uh, less significant, while things like HPCG and Grad 500, uh, you know, more uh, things that relate to other new fields and also to realistic application became more highlight and became more highlighted and K became no more than those. And of course, the new machines came about like the uh, Scott Scuba and University of Tokyo jointly built the uh, Oak Forest Bax, which was the first uh, uh, general purpose mini core machine um, to become uh, number one in Japan and, and well, many core CPU machine. And then in August 2017, PostK was announced at, um, uh, to have adopt the ARM ISA. Of course, there were lots of discussions in the background, and the decision was made much earlier, but it was first, first announced in 17. And then uh, in April, I became the director. At the same time, uh, the center was renamed uh, Weekend RCCS. And in August last year, Fujitsu unveiled the ARM64FX. 
And in October, and uh, the several basic research projects um, we already have started, just like when Post K was start, uh, K launched, Post K started. We're doing very similar things here. Uh, we, you know, in Japan, we plan for a long time for next generation, so we already started some basic projects for the next generation if we ever have one. And uh, in November, yeah, yeah, ASD ABCI becomes number one top 100 machine, but it was built for AI, and that was a machine I led the development. And this was um, also a sign of the times that artificial intelligence has become the new target, uh, target application. And this carries over to Post-K and, uh, and the successor new machines. And, uh, and of course, there were a lot of uh, uh, politics and uh, bureaucratic procedures to basically build, uh, to uh, get the permission to build the K. And uh, um, it's, uh, I'm delighted to tell you that you know, it's almost done. Um, and uh, we also have a naming con contest. So if you have a cool name, uh, post-K is a, just a code word, a, a development uh, keyword. So we really need a new name so I can stop calling it post-K. So if you have a new name, you can make a proposal build a, build a website and, and uh, we'll shall announce a new name shortly. And uh, from here on, it's, uh, the schedule is somewhat speculative. So this is just, uh, disclaimer is this changes without without notice. In the first half, hopefully manufacturing will commence this year. And uh, we'll also have a simultaneous, at the center, we will have a simultaneous uh, uh, activity to um, basically look for, you know, to do basic research for future generation machines. And then um, uh, in August, uh, we will terminate the uh, operation of the K computer and, you know, and basically honor its uh, contributions to the society, uh, to the humankind. And then um, installation starts subsequently, and um, hopefully the installation and the uh, production runs, and uh, pre-production and production can uh, happen in a very staged manner, although these dates are still subject to change. So don't take these as uh, very solid. But uh, at latest, we hope to start the production by 21, uh, if not earlier. So uh, there will be many announced that it's may be made on post-K. So um, over the press, over you know, at, at conferences like SC, ISC, and the, those places. So uh, well, please watch out. Um, so our center, like I said, is not just focused on uh, operating K or design and building post-K. It really is a center for computing computing in the high end. So what we're saying, as I have become a director, is to say that we are studying computing as a scientific discipline, and by, uh, by, comp by studying computing by, as a scientific discipline means we study science of computing, more like computer science, and we study science by computing, using the immense power to apply to uh, solving problems in other scientific disciplines, to, and these jointly, uh, in jointly with uh, there will be other disciplines that will affect the uh, these uh, these two sciences. That is to say, uh, for example, advances in device technology. Uh, so uh, altogether, we will investigating uh, the science for computing. Uh, what are the sciences needed to advance computing? So that's our that's our mission. It's not to say we just do simulation. It's not to say we just do AI. Uh, we just we are really set out to do, you know. Computing science. That's our that's our mission. Um, having said that, uh, we we are of course uh, already from the days of the K computer, uh, post K computer. Um, there's been significant activities to uh, in uh, uh, that kind of partially, at least partially, uh, realize this vision. And uh, and uh, people, a lot of people in this room, including myself, were involved in the process. Uh, the, uh, one of the successes of the post-K, I think, can be attributed to the massive amounts of co-design activity uh, that, was, uh, that was initiated back in 2011 and staged in the various ways um, leading up to uh, what the, the actual machine right now. So uh, a lot of people from the application space um, contributed. There were lots of contributions from the computer science side and also computer architecture, not only computer architecture, but software and also uh, a lot of people from the algorithm side, uh, which culminated in the, uh, this uh, machine, which I think will be, again, a game changer um, in the HPC space. So um, 
Uh, I won't go into the details too much because I think Yutaka and uh, other people will go into the details of the architecture. Uh, but in a nutshell, uh, if, you don't, you know, if you need to do something else, in a nutshell, what, we, what I can say is PostK on one hand is a mini core ARM CPU. Um, has you know, 48 or depending on how you, how you count, uh, you, you can say it has 52 cores. It's a brand new core design, you know, doesn't take the, uh, unlike some, you know, uh, there's a misconception that we take the embedded uh, mobile phone core and put it into post-K, no, that's not true. Well, no, it's on ISA, but it's a brand new high performance ARM core design by Fujitsu. So it has a, a close to Xeon class energy performance, and, but it complies completely with the ARM uh, ecosystem. It's not just the ISA, all the other specs can conform to ARM standards. So it boots when, uh, when the first chip came along, it booted Red Hat Linux uh, out of the box, and uh, it will probably run Windows, um, hopefully, but we'll see. Um, that's, one, that's one aspect of the chip, but also it's also very much like a GPU-like processor, and it's a streaming processor by nature. So it has a very long vector of very different data types, not just, uh, uh, 64 bits, but also uh, it can do um, uh, like float, uh, 32 and 16 bit floats. And also it can do uh, up to one byte integer, which is great for machine learning. In fact, uh, uh, we have an ongoing project uh, which has started to try to get uh, one integer 64 way vector unit applied to uh, deep learning. Um, yes, and it also has various uh, memory uh, memory-based optimizations like uh, cache localization has uh, high HPM2 uh, unpackaged memory that has a massive memory bandwidth to begin with one terabyte per second, and so bytes for flop is 0.4, which is the same as K. So all the application kind of scales in the same way, just 100 times uh, 50, 50 to 100 times faster. The you know the the real the real secret is actually it's about 40 to 50 times faster, but if you sync for position, sometimes it gets to be 100. Um, that's an intrinsic barrier. Um, and most importantly, just like, for example, some chips like NVIDIA, um, uh, Pascal, and Volta, it has chip to chip interconnect that's really fast. It's 40 gigabytes per second. Um, it's not as fast as um, NVLink, but it scales to 100,000 nodes a little more. So it's sort of like it's a hybrid that takes the best out of GPUs and CPU um, and, makes it, and, and makes a really high performance, uh, groundbreaking high performance chip. So comparing it to other chips um, in the marketplace right now, um, you'll notice that uh, a lot of the specs like peak memory bandwidth and stream triad and uh, gigaflop to watt and limpack is very similar to a Volta. Uh, now, of course, maybe the next generation will be better, but right now it's sort of on par with, uh, with the GPUs. Um, so although it's a CPU, it's much, um, it's much faster and much more efficient, about several times more efficient than the uh, standard CPUs of the day, or even some of the HPC optimized chip site nice nights landing. Um, so this is a slide that was announced at, by Fujitsu um, at Hot Chips. So, um, so the DGEM is about 2.7 teraflops, actually now. And the uh, stream triad is about 800 some gigabytes per second. But the real application performances are about three times faster than the pre previous generation FX100, the Spark FX10 um, chip which is um, the predecessor to the post-K ARM C4FX. And uh, that's the, uh, so compared to the baseline, it's about three times faster. So this baseline is about, when you do the benchmarks, which has some open benchmarks, and it's about twice as fast per, per socket compared to uh, the high-end Intel Haswell. So compared to Haswell, um, each, uh, each chip is about six times faster. Compared to Skylake, maybe it's about four on per chip basis and much more power efficient but much more power efficient, so. And um, uh, but all this, you know, if you build a very specialized chip, this will really amount to nothing because you don't have a software ecosystem. But you know, thanks to, uh, we work, we're working with many, many people, people at Bristol, we're starting work with people at uh, DOE, people of course with ARM, hopefully we'll work, hope to work with other partners to populate the HPC ARM ecosystem. So you know, people at Sandia, for example, have been doing a lot of tests on to see if any of the x86 codes run right out of the box on these machines and, and in fact do. But it's not to say that we should st sit back and relax. Uh, we really need to, do, to build lots of tool chains for, to populate the ARM ecosystem, uh, especially to support the SVE uh, vector extension. 
Um, so this is packaged up like that. Um, the green, the blue wires are the network. Um, it's 384 nodes per, per rack, about a petaflop double precision rack, if you worry about those metrics. Um, well, and um, uh, it's internet by Tofu60 network, uh, just like K. Of course, the numbers have bumped up uh, a bit. So the latency between, the shortest latency between the nodes is, of a, is about 0.5 microseconds. And the injection bandwidth is uh, nearly 40 gigabytes per second. So it's about 400 gigabit speed per chip. And uh, it's scalable to more than 100,000 nodes. We don't know. In fact, we haven't tested more than, uh, we haven't really tested this number. So we, ha we haven't proven that. But um, at least um, we'll, have, um, we'll have a three level storage. So the full machine spec uh, will be more than 150,000 nodes and about 7.58 million cores or more, something like that. These are high performance I, uh, ARM, like I said, ARM 8.2 cores. They're not like the little tiny cores, like on a GPU. Uh, about more than 400 racks. I can't give the real numbers yet. Um, uh, we will at some point. And so it's about 40 megawatts, um, including the, the cooling facilities. Uh, in the entire IDC, uh, but the PUE is really good. With high pressure DLC, we will achieve 1.1 uh, PUE or, or perhaps less. So uh, looking at the benchmarks, uh, this will be equivalent to something like 15 to 30 million Xeon cores, depending on what kind of workload you have. So the money we have spent to actually build the machine is quite reasonable. I can't tell you the number numbers yet, but the money spent to actually build a machine plus to develop the chip to build a machine already is much cheaper than ha what would have been if we bought the machine using standard processors. And of course, um, uh, three more minutes. And of course, this will be amenable to uh, workloads other than simulation. We'll have lots of those presentations today, so I will skip them. So we've been number one on the Graph 500 uh, for a long time. And of course, we will try to continue this on the post-K, but we'll probably achieve an uh, order of magnitude increase in the graph processing capability. Also, uh, we believe the post-K chip will be amenable to uh, running uh, deep learning workloads, both training and, but also uh, and inference, especially training real fast, thanks to the very fast performance of the processor itself using supporting short precision arithmetic plus very high bandwidth. And there's been several work recently that demonstrates just accelerating gems is not the only way to accelerate uh, deep learning. Rather, for example, to compute of, uh, FFT-based convolution, actually bandwidth matters in the system. And of course, in order to do any sort of data parallel or model parallel scaling, you need networks with very low latency and very fat, high bandwidth. And, uh, but that's precisely what we have, as we have demonstrated, because like I said, the network is, well, is 0.5 microsecond latency and 40 gigabyte per second injection. And this will scale, allow scaling of the data parallel workloads to immense levels. So the target I have is that we will scale machine learning training to 100,000 nodes. Um, finally, um, our, uh, we need to look beyond that. So Moore's, end of Moore's law is approaching. So post K, great machine, you know, innovative. Um, it'll probably rock the boat. But we need to do, look beyond because Moore's law is ending. So, um, so in some sense, um, the post K will be the uh, sort of like a pinnacle of the classes of machine that have written on this mini core wave of computing progress. So in the past, we have done you know the vector machines and so forth. There have been instruction level parallelism. That's been more the nod scaling era. So Earth Simulator was last of the kind, and. Uh, now, when the mini core and you know the trend started by machines like uh, Tsubame and others, um, so uh, we are reaching the plateau, so to speak. And there will be Tsubame. Uh, I'm sorry, there will be post K. There will be other machines uh, like in, uh, in U.S., China, and Europe uh, that will be reach exascale using this technology. But beyond um, past 2025 or maybe later, we will look. To, we need to look for other methodologies to achieve scaling. So. We're starting to investigate this in many projects. We're looking at new novel architectures, new memory system, photonics, We're looking at ways of increasing memory bandwidth because we cannot increase the flops anymore. So how do we increase the memory bandwidth by tenfold? 
as compared to post K will be imminent, very important. If anybody tells you you can increase flops more, there are not, yeah, well. well. So uh, we believe that computing uh, will definitely change from the classic right hand side of when we have nodes and processors to more of a nebula of, uh, of photonically connected accelerated devices. And uh, uh, this is something that we look towards 25, 2030 and beyond. And that's just, and, but really, the algorithm will have to change too. For example, can you solve PDEs using uh, Ising models? So those are the things we'll be looking at. So, um, uh, so you know, over the next two days, there'll be plenty of content and uh, hopefully you will enjoy having visited Kobe and perhaps enjoy the delicacies such as Kobe beef if you're not vegetarian. Thank you. <laughs>